Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Shklov and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today the title of our program is If This Child Was Yours. And my guests are Stephen Lane, Bridget Morgan Vickerton, and Crystal Glendon. Stephen Lane is a paralegal consultant who has been appointed special master in many cases involving abused and neglected children. Bridget Morgan Vickerton is an attorney who handles a wide range of civil and commercial litigation with an emphasis on consumer class action. Crystal Glendon is also an attorney who practices criminal, defense, family law, appeals, and civil litigation. All three of my guests are also advocates for abused and neglected children. The focus of our discussion today is on the protections afforded under Hawaii law for these children, including the right of foster children to have legal counsel appointed to represent them. Steve Lane recently submitted testimony in support of a proposed Hawaii law that would require certain persons to report abuse of a foster child to the family court and would also provide the family court with the authority to appoint legal counsel to represent the abused child. In essence, Steve tes Steve's testimony through the legislators was, if this child was yours, this is what you would do for your child. Steve, Crystal, Bridget, welcome. Good to, good to see you all today. And this is a serious topic. And Steve, I want to start with you. What, wh why do we need these protections? What are we talking about uh, for <coughs> abused and neglected children, and especially for foster children? Well, there are about 2,100 foster children in Hawaii each year. Some 3,500 to 4,000 children each year suffer abuse or neglect of some sort. <clears throat> a child who's in foster care, who's under the supervision of the court, uh, it does not have access to a lawyer because one, the minority status, they're too young. If you're under 18, you can't hire an attorney of your own. And two, their ward status. They are effectively a guardian. The state of Hawaii is their guardian. So that's why foster children need access to counsel. Otherwise, they would be unrepresented, fundamentally unfranchised. They have, they have no one to stand up for them no as a speak lawyer. For them. Correct. Okay. And uh, Bridget and Crystal, would you add anything to what Steve has said? That sums it up pretty well. Um, that's a major hole in the system, or at least it was until a protocol that we'll talk about in a little bit was implemented. Um, foster children really didn't have a voice in the legal system. Okay. I absolutely agree. And without that voice, without a protocols that have been set in place, we would continue to have no voice, but we're hoping to rectify that. And when we talk about abuse and neglect, just generally, what is that uh, type of thing? All, it covers a wide spectrum, that, right? It does. And this protocol is intended to provide access to counsel for children who suffer physical abuse or even emotional abuse. And under this protocol, various court officers, CASA workers, social workers, uh, others who are officers of the court are required to report any instance of abuse to the family court judge so a special master can be appointed to represent them. Bridget, what currently exists in the state of Hawaii? What, what is the status now of the protections afforded under law for abused and neglected children, especially foster children? Well, typically, if a child is injured, abused, or neglected, um, and is still in the care of their parents, their parents can initiate a legal action on their behalf, they can seek out an attorney, and they can pursue a tort claim on their own child's behalf. Yeah, if, if this child is yours. <laughs> right. However, uh, for foster children, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, there has been implemented a foster tort protocol in the family court that was adopted by Judge Browning that requires guardians ad litem, CASA workers, social workers, Department of Human Services workers to immediately report to the family court uh, any injury that they suspect may give rise to a tort claim. These individuals are already required by statute to report injuries to the court, but what the protocol does is require them to immediately make those reports. The court is then required to appoint a special master to investigate, to collect records, 
um, to interview individuals to ascertain and determine whether or not a colorful tort claim exists. And the master's kind of what you've been doing, Steve, That's there, on, on some occasions, right? Yes. Okay, and, and this new protocol, how long has that been in practice, approximately? I believe we're going on two years now. I think it was appointed in early, it was adopted, excuse me, in early 2018. Crystal, you're, you're familiar with this protocol, and how, how is it, in actual practice, what happens? And what, 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 what have you discovered in actual cases? Well, I, I guess the number one thing would be that the reason why the tort protocol is so important and getting things moving along quickly and having those reports made is because we're dealing with the statute of limitations when it comes to tortious conduct, um, and that statute of limitations is two years. So that's why it's very important. Um, and what I've experienced personally is, um, actually, Mr. Lane here is the special master in one of the cases that I'm handling. And what happened was he was notified of a situation um, was appointed special master through petition of his own, and from there um, completed the investigation, was able to get records, um, talk to witnesses, primarily talk to the client, and from there hired me to file a complaint on behalf of a minor who is currently in foster care, falls within the, pro the tort protocol, um, and ultimately we were able to accomplish the filing of her complaint. Um, when you talked about abuse that these children have suffered uh, for this particular case, and I will not mention any names of because course. of her status as a minor, um, this poor young woman was within the care of the Department of Human Services when she was sexually assaulted. Um, and this would have been by someone who had access to her while she was in the foster home that she was in. Um, so ultimately, we are proceeding with her case, and, and that's essentially how it's worked in my experience. Okay, now in all of you, I mean, what, what happens? I mean, the, 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 somebody reports something, and then what, what's the next step? <laughs> somebody says something to the court, they're, they're required to do that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, does it always happen, I guess? Is it doesn't question. always happen. Yeah. What's, what's supposed to happen uh, is one of these individuals enumerated in Judge Browning's protocol are required as mandated reporters to report any instance of physical or emotional suspected abuse. When that report is made to the judge, the judge then customarily appoints a special master to obtain records, to examine the case as to whether or not there appears to be a claim, and that special master, if he finds evidence of a claim, is empowered to hire counsel to represent the child. So, so that, there's actually a court hearing held to make that initial determination? Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, that is not what usually happens. And I think that's a product of a lack of education and knowledge about the protocol. Uh, the implementation of this protocol has been irregular at best. In fact, I do you not mean within know. within the courts? Within the courts, right. Okay. Uh, I think that is a lack of education. I, I would say mainly about the tort protocol. Um, I'll say that I, I was a public defender for uh, almost 15 years, and I practiced a bulk, the bulk of my practice was in family court. And I had a lot of cases that crossed over between juvenile as well, um, children who are also in the foster care system. This isn't something that I was aware of while I was a public defender. Um, and I believe that under, under the tort protocol, I would have been one of the ones who could have reported, mm -hmm. as well as made referrals to the court to have special masters appointed, because what I saw was a lot of the children who happened to be within the juvenile system, so charged with either law violations or um, status offenses, they were also foster children, and a lot of them did suffer abuse, and that's why they ended up there. But you didn't, and so, I mean, you didn't know about... I didn't. And, and so how do we get, I mean... Well, on the other end of things, yeah. there are attorneys who would be capable, willing um, to bring these cases, and I don't think the plaintiff's bar, the personal injury bar, is aware of it either. So one thing that the court will need is a, is a list of attorneys who are willing and ready to serve, um, both as masters and as attorneys for the children, and I think that we need to educate um, everybody in all the different realms that we've been discussing to, so, to uh, disseminate this. Judge Browning came up with this protocol, I, I hear you telling me. And, well, I think and Bridget how, how, and, and Mr. Lane came up with the protocol and then shopped <coughs> it around. Well, Bridget and I worked on designing a protocol basically modeled on the Los Angeles County Protocol several years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we presented to the Y Supreme Court Standing Committee on Children and Family Court. They rejected the protocol. Uh, wow. 
In response, I went to talk to Judge Browning, uh, <laughs> expressed my displeasure, and he said, then I'll adopt it. Thank goodness for that. Had not Judge so, Browning so, not done so on his own motion, he was a senior family court judge at the so time. Like there an, wouldn't have been any protocol. Like an administrative rule. That's that, correct. It's become a, an administrative and rule. And he, has he published that? Is that out there for the, the lawyers? Or, or how, how do you uh, get uh, it out there? I am reliably informed that copies of this protocol were sent to every judge in every circuit in, in the state of Hawaii some time ago. Okay. Um, there needs to be more education, as Ms. Morgan has, has, has mentioned both within the bar and on the bench. Uh, the the uh, guardian ad litem committee uh, community needs to be educated about this. Uh, there are lots and lots of people who appear on a regular basis in family court who need to know about this protocol more fully than they do now. Is this, should the courts should do something? I guess the bar association should be doing something. And the state of Hawaii, Crystal? I mean, I mean who, how do we get the word out there to, well. to people? We start with programs like this, and mm -hmm. so my hope is that this is one of the, I guess, leaping pads for, for more people to find out about the protocol. Um, I think that continuing legal education for the attorneys that could be involved um, would be important, and training perhaps within the family court, not just for the, the judges themselves, but for the many staff members who are connected with the courts and who are mandated reporters under the protocol educating and, um, I guess, proliferating the information so that there's no mystery about it. I think a lot of people might be hesitant because, you know, you start talking lawyers and suing, and people um, get a little hesitant to, to speak up and or make the referrals. But I think, ultimately, it comes down to the advocacy for the children. And if this child was yours, right? Yes. And, I mean, you, you want someone to be an advocate for your child. Now, why... Why was the proposal rejected when you folks first proposed it? What? Oh, I, I can't speculate on that. I, I, I think can. it was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I think there are probably a lot of reasons and I, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. It wasn't something that was developed at the time. Um, I wouldn't want to speculate on why it was rejected. Um, well, the majority of the, of the committee members of, of the Committee of, of uh, Children and Family Court uh, were state employees, many of them were uh, DAGs, many of them were social workers with the Department of Human Services. And I think they were frankly fearful that if uh, such a policy became official, that their agencies would be on the short end of a lawsuit. Um, I think that's probably the reason why the committee rejected the proposal. I think it should be pointed out on, on the favorable side. To the best of my knowledge, Hawaii is the only state in the nation that has an equivalent protocol in place that provides access to counsel for children who are otherwise voiceless for foster children. And we should be proud of that. So we gotta start, is, is, what, is what you're all saying. Mm -hmm. We need to educate, get the word out there, and people can take that and run with it and protect the children as if they were their own children. Is that what I'm hearing you tell me? And so that's an optimistic viewpoint, although there's been some <laughs> downsides. I think that's, uh, that's a good summation. I think I'd add one more thing. I think right now we have basically an administrative rule. I'd like to see this codified by way of a statute. I would like to see this become an official statute within the next year so it's a matter of law. And we're going to take a break right now and come back and I want to ask a little bit more about that and also about actual cases. I, I, I know you can't tell me the names of people but I'd like to hear about some actual cases so that the people that watch this program can touch base with reality. So thank you. We'll be right back in a minute. We're going to take a short break and come back and talk about if this child was yours. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that would just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it, even financial health. We'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, from 11 to 11.30.
This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off. And so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Welcome back. I am Mark Shklov with Law Across the Sea with <sighs> Steve Lane, Bridget Morgan, Crystal Glendon. We are talking about if this child was yours and protections afforded under Hawaii law for children, especially foster children. Uh, when we left off, Steve, um, we were talking about a couple things. Uh, and I want to kind of go back. What, what laws are out there uh, uh, that are still, that could be passed to protect children? And then I, I want to ask Bridget, Crystal, some actual cases. Well, I think right now we're looking principally at the protocol as it stands now, as a sort of an administrative rule. What I would like to see is that protocol converted into a statute. Bridget has uh, some good information on, on that subject. Well, to add to that, there is a provision of the Child Protective Act, the Hawaii Child Protective Act, that lists, enumerates all of the rights of foster children. It would be very simple to add to that specific subsection of 587 that all foster children shall enjoy the same rights with respect to being able to pursue tort claims that non-foster children enjoy. Mm. I think that would be a quick, simple uh, way to revise the statute to implement the, to the tort protocol um, and codify it. Now, I, I've noticed that there has been a couple attempts for both Senate and House bills to pass laws in the state of Hawaii that resemble the family court, court pr protocol, but they, they never got, got out of committee. From what I could see, they die in committee. And, and what? What's the base? Why? Why do they die in committee? I mean, anybody have a, a knowledge of that? Or? State agencies testify against it. And the last time I testified before the legislature on behalf of one of these bills, the attorney general's office came in and said it's not necessary. Some of the real issues are that the courts are already plagued with more cases they can handle. Um, I think that a lot of people see this as something that would. Um, raise costs. Um, so a lot, a lot of the testimony I think had to do with increased costs, practical things like that that I think can be resolved if, if a push is made to resolve. Yeah, I, I, I guess you know, there was some concern I read in some testimony about the cost of masters. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, okay. Well, I'd like to add to that just briefly. <laughs> the protocol in Los Angeles, which this was patterned after. Uh, has been successful largely because it's generated so much money for the city and county of Los Angeles in the recovery of uh, third-party damage liability tort claims. claims. And tort claims. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is most of the injuries that children suffer in foster care uh, aren't claims that arise against the state custodian. They're claims like any other kid suffers, automobile accidents, products cases, any number of other uh, situations that cause injury to children. Uh, this is not simply a way to bring more cases against the state of Hawaii. Well, let, let's bring reality in here. C Crystal, please tell me what are some of the, I understand you can't tell me who Absolutely. we're talking about, but give me some examples of cases of child neglect, abuse that would benefit from counsel. Absolutely. Um, so I, I did mention the one that I'm handling right now. Right. So that one... Um, absolute benefit for counsel for this particular child who otherwise has been disenfranchised and just um, ha has had to suffer. How old was the child? Um, 16. But the allegations were at the time when she was 13. Mm. And mm. so we're talking about a child who was under the legal, uh, legal age to consent to any kind of sexual contact. Um, and we're talking about statutory rape, essentially, which is what happened. And you were appointed? As counsel in that case? Or well, in not? this particular yeah. case, I was approached by Mr. Lane to evaluate the case, make contact with the client, and then from there um, to proceed with filing the claim on behalf of the client. Is that pursuant to the protocol? That's correct. Okay, I see. Uh, any other cases? Uh, 
active, no. I mean, I can think of a couple of examples of foster children who I would have liked to have referred under this protocol to an attorney. Um, you know, just children who were my clients when they were, when I was a public defender, um, who were within the foster care system and just suffered abject, horrendous conditions by their foster parents. So I think the people that are, con they are the people that are contemplated within this short protocol. Um, one of the cases that I had, the children that, one of the children that I represented was beaten on a daily basis and subjected to what I would call slavery on a daily basis. And I mean, essentially came through to me through a juvenile case. However, I think this would have been the perfect example for referral. Steve? Well, the case is probably best known in Hawaii involving this protocol is the Peter Kemma case mm -hmm. on the Big Island, in which I was appointed special master. Uh, this is a unique case. It presents some unique legal issues, including a statute of limitations issue. Peter Kemma disappeared, disappeared and we later learned was murdered by his parents some 20 years ago. And that case is presently in litigation. Bridget, what, how about you? What I, you haven't actually, I haven't actually done a case myself as an attorney under the protocol, but uh, we do, my firm handles personal injury cases on behalf of children all the time. And um, those are cases that would be subject to the protocol if, um, if they occurred, if the tort had occurred to a foster children. Um, we have cases where parents have sued preschools on behalf of their, their children for abuse at the preschool. We have products liability cases where the parents have to bring it on behalf of the child because the, you know, the minor and um, it has to be brought through a parent. So those are cases that you can imagine if those kids had just been in foster care without this protocol, there would be no recourse for them. Uh, and these are kids who are injured and require lifelong care and resources because of their injuries. As foster kids should have the same rights as, as kids who are not in the foster system to bring those claims and to get some sort of recovery for their injuries. And that kind of shows the disparity, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, people in, who are not foster children, they hire you to right. represent the children, take care of the children. Foster children don't have those same opportunities. That's right. correct. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely. All right. What, why, why do you guys do this? You know, Steve, why, why do you be a master? What, what, where, or what, you know, and what, what motivates you? Well, I was a uh, foster parent with the state of Hawaii for some 20 years, raised four foster kids myself as a single parent, uh, and I've seen firsthand some of the challenges that foster children face, and I think this is another way to deal with that issue. Crystal, what's, what's your thoughts? Well, um... You know, as I said, my background as a public defender in the juvenile section, my, my heart it goes out to these children and watching them suffer and being able to assist them as a public defender was one way to help. And now that I can take on a new role and represent them and advocate for them in a civil capacity, that's why I do it. So you, you've moved into private practice now, and yes. you're doing a wide, I can see you're doing a wide, <laughs> wide range of, of cases. Perhaps a little too wide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but I do appreciate Mr. Lane alerting me to the protocol and bringing me on board. Like I said, I see it as one more way of advocating for the children who otherwise don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. Bridget, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, you're, you're, you, you don't have to be involved in this. You're in private practice. You well, do I am it. now. I uh, <laughs> got my feet wet in the legal profession with uh, Legal Aid, Legal oh, Aid Society okay. of Hawaii as a guardian ad litem. And oh, okay. um, that's, that's where I was first introduced to the law and represented foster kids throughout the islands. And um, actually met Mr. Lane during that work yeah. as a guardian ad litem. And so we, we just saw a lot of holes in the system and saw a lot of injuries that were going unreported and unprosecuted. And um, since I've been in private practice, but it's always been an issue that's near and dear to my heart and um, needs to be addressed. So what, what is the status now? Where do we go from here? Uh, what's lacking what, and what, what needs to be done going forward? I mean, I mean, with respect to the courts, and, and also, you know, I'm a, I'm a little disturbed about the state uh, not taking action, you know, in, in cases where they knew about something going on. We're going to give them a hand. <laughs> All right, so excuse me. Yeah, what, what, 
what, what, I think what, education what, is, is one of the first things that needs to be done. I think uh, members of the bar and the bench need to be uh, more familiar with this protocol. Uh, I think the suggestion Bridget made uh, to amend some of the HRS revisions uh, is something that could be do, done comparatively easily. So this becomes a matter of law, not just uh, administrative rule. Uh, and I think those are some things that can be accomplished in the next uh, year or so. And that's where we're going? Is that where you see the emphasis of this? I think so. I mean, ultimately, that's the only way to get this word out so that more people are aware of it, so that the people who are stakeholders, as well as the ones who can report, know what to do. Bridget, you're, you're, you're going to advocate? I will advocate, <laughs> and I think um, the biggest place that I can have an impact is just to educate the bar and try to get that list of attorneys who are willing to serve both as masters and attorneys, get those lists out to the court, let them know that there are people out there willing to serve who are um, court attorneys who've been practicing for decades, and they can call on us um, when needed. You know, I, I like what Steve said, too. You make a lot of money in a tort case when you prevail, and that should not then be a drawback that is often seen in, in state mm -hmm. concerns about money. Well, states, the especially in foster care, it's really the state that has a lien against um, mm. a, a case and for, me, for the medical care that the child would have received. And they will get that money back, or at least a portion of it, if, if the case is pursued and if, if funds are realized on that case. Okay, we've got about a minute left. In a few seconds, could you each briefly tell me what you have learned from being involved in this with these foster kids and abused kids? I have learned that foster kids are some of the most resilient um, people on this earth and that we owe it to them. We as society that has a voice and has power, we owe it to them mm. to um, have the same rights that any other kid has. And um, in particular, what we're discussing today is the right to pursue claims if they've been injured, just like a child who's not in foster care. This is not an inconsequential problem. We have 3,500 children a year in Hawaii who suffer abuse and neglect. 2,400 kids a year in foster care. This needs more attention. Foster children, they deserve our compassion and they deserve access to whatever tools we have in our toolbox to assist them. And that's something that I know I'm willing to do. Everyone here on this panel is willing to do. There are a lot more people out there who are willing to do it. And I guess if they knew this, they knew what was happening, and they realized that if this child was theirs, this is what they would want. They'd want counsel to represent them and protect them and help them. Uh, hopefully, we can move forward with that. I'd like to thank all of you, uh, Steve, Bridget, Crystal, thank you all for thank being here. Thank you for here. having we, us. We, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to the next time we get together to talk about the progress we've made. Aloha. 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 Thank you very much.